Hi, everybody. Simon and Jordan are here again for our virtual tasting. We have Diana Claxton from uh, the Bacchus Group um, joining us. And our guest honor today is Hubert de Billy, uh from Paul Roger. So welcome, Hubert. Thank you so much. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Give us a little bit of background. Ah, my background, I'm the first, uh, I am the fifth generation of the Paul Roger family. I start, uh, I start in the company in 88 after to study business in California and in France and to, and also uh, uh, study a bit of winemaking. And uh, it's very surprising because I went to Southern California to work <laughs> To learn winemaking, uh, I've been working for Callaway Vineyard and Winery uh, in Temecula, uh, Riverside County, yeah. and uh, I went also to work to learn how to sell something to sell wine. So I've been a reps for Harrods. I've been a reps for Dun and Royce, which was a distribution company in UK at that time. And I, and of course, I started in the company in '88. So yesterday, I would say. <laughs> I, was, I still remember '88. It was that long ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and I'm very, very pleased now to, to represent uh, my wine and my family, mostly all around the world, uh, but a bit more particularly North America and Asia. Okay. Is there a lot of pressure to live up to five generations of wine, you think? No, 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 because, you know, champagne is a glamorous product. Uh, and it is, uh, it is quite easy to attract uh, people and so to attract members of the family. Uh, so the new generation is in, is in, um, oh, in training. One is coming in a few weeks' time. He's still in a other champagne company, but he's going to leave in a few days, and we'll welcome him uh, in approximately a month. And my own, uh, my own son, uh, my own son has been uh, working for Muto Rothschild for the last two years. At the present time, is learning how to make sparkling wine, but in UK, <laughs> to uh, Hamburgdon vineyards. Okay. And he will come back uh, to France uh, in December. But I think he will come in the company in approximately two or three years. He need a bit more training, but so as the the sixth generation is in preparation and our uh, knuck. No knocking at the door, I will say. <laughs> right. <laughs> I remember when I was doing WSET and all my education, this is probably about 15 years ago. And yeah. that, 15 years ago, like England, Southwest or Southeast England was kind of like the, the next horizon for sparkling. Is it still kind yeah. of seen that way? Yes, uh, it is true that the sparkling industry is growing in UK. Uh, it is true that global warming are, are helping, uh, so it's it's a bit it's a bit easier, and it is true that global warming make the wines are better, or they are better. I would say easier to drink. Uh, uh, technically, they have they know how to make sparkling and. Most of the winemakers are French, so it's not a big deal. Um, the problem we have nowadays in UK is the fact that, as you know, it's a quite humid uh, country with a very mild winter, uh, which makes that first, in terms of disease, it is not so easy to manage because uh, a good a good frost, a good winter frost, not a spring frost, but a good winter frost kill a lot of bugs and a lot of disease, uh, which is not happening in UK. That is the first problem. And it's the second problem, uh, the, 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 I would say, 
the the harvests are up and down. It's it is true that it's it's they have uh, exactly the same problem that Champagne used to have. Uh, I, I would say forty years ago. Okay. You know. Uh, uh, we have uh, in Champagne, for example, 84 was a dreadful year. Uh, nowadays, nowadays, due to global warming, and so global warming have not only negative points, they have few, few positive. It is true that if you have noticed the number of vintage that we can produce in a decade nowadays is growing, and that is global warming. It's true that nowadays, uh, this year we have done the earliest, the earliest harvest uh, of of all the history of Champagne. Really, by uh, starting on the twenty fourth of August. August. And finishing some some era was finished before the first of September, which is which is never seen. Uh, and uh, the latest. The latest was finished on the fourth of, of of September. Wow! Uh, so uh, it is true that this year we had a very warm year, very dry. So the dryness has been very good uh, because then the disease have no potential to increase, so it was very easy to manage. Uh, at the opposite, uh, alors. In the Chardonnay, the acidity was there. They, I don't know why, but the Chardonnay had difficulty to mature this year. Uh, so we we make we make sure the the harvest of Chardonnay. In fact, it was a later spot, and uh, the wine was good and acidic. Uh, at the opposite, Pinot and Meunier was not so acidic. So we will play a kind of balance. To find the right acidity, but I can, uh, or I can announce with 99% of chance of good chance that than 2020 uh, will be a vintage. It'll be a, it'll be a strong vintage. Yeah, yeah. Stand yeah, yeah. Um, Mr. Rubel, um, you, you mentioned climate change as a, a driver of uh, even the possibility of, of having sparkling wine done in England. Do you also find it changing the nature of the type of wine that's being made in Champagne? Are you still, you're still able to make the type of uh, wines that, that, that you, you feel uh, you want to make? Uh, you're not, when I was in, for instance, Montalcino a, a few years ago, we found more and more producers who were not planting on south facing vineyards. They were planting a little more around the hill in order to retain acidity because they were uh, worried about losing acidity. That's that's so far not a problem in Champagne. Uh, I will say uh, I will say no, not really, uh, not at the present time. It could be if it continues. No, it can be different. Uh, I will say. Uh, what the good, you know, in Champagne, what's happening is not the opposite, but I will say some part of the vineyard, for example, if you look at the Man Valley, yeah. uh, the slope which is looking north was was uh, so so uh, many years. Now, with global warming, they make very good wine. And uh, it is true that on, on, uh, on average, we have loose acidity, but due to the fact that Champagne is a blending product, uh, we mustn't forget we the, the the key point of Champagne is to blend different cru, different cépages, which makes that we can play with that. Uh, we don't use exactly the same cru uh, and the same way we used to, but I will say at the end we produce approximately the same kind of wine. The, the only difference before, uh, or not the only difference, but one of the main difference is before Champagne was 12 degrees and it was really the maximum. We were obliged to chaptalize at the harvest. 
Do you know that in Champagne we are allowed to chalcalize uh, to gain two, two degrees of alcohol, uh, which is something we don't do anymore. Uh, uh, we don't do it anymore. This year is not a problem, but last year, for example, we, we, have, been able, able, we have been obliged to change a bit the degree to be sure to be lower than 13 degrees. Mm. Uh, the appellation stop at 13. Uh, and, uh, and today, uh, in some village, uh, the, in some village, to produce a champagne on the, just at the limit of 13, uh, it is some years a bit challenging. Huh. So that could be the difference uh, in a long, in a long, uh, on a long way. Uh, perhaps one day we will be obliged to change, to ask to change the appellation and to increase the level, uh, to give us one de half degree of alcohol more. Mm -hmm. uh, at the present time, we can play. This year, for example, we had some, uh, we had some, uh, some village at. Uh, uh, 9.8 was the lower, uh, the highest was 11, so it was perf it was good, it was good, we can manage that. Uh, but when you have uh, an average at 11, which was the case uh, by last year, uh, and knowing that you are go going to gain uh, a bit more than one degree of alcohol with a second fermentation. Mm. Uh, it is a bit, uh, <laughs> a bit, a bit, uh, a bit difficult sometimes. <laughs> right. Uh, oh, so thank you. The problem before it was, it is true that now the, all our harvests are fully mature, right. which was not the case before. So, uh, uh, in the eighties, some some years we have been obliged to. To, to peak at eight degrees Celsius, uh, eight degree potential uh, alcohol, uh, and so we were obliged to capitalize to gain a minimum one one, and to raise to to achieve. the best is ten for us. Mm -hmm. Do you so uh, yes, we are obliged to adapt ourselves? Do you think that in lieu of like you say climate change and things like that, do you think people's perception of what good vintages of champagne are going to change in a sense that, you know, having those cooler vintages where you have the much more peak acidity, where the ones that can, um, you know, are much more longer lasting, because those see, vintages seem like they're coming less and less now, and you know, you might more see more of a more generous style, like you said, a lot of very ripe. Uh, ripe fruit coming through and that sort of thing and it just might just be a whole shift in style uh moving forward alors yes it's difficult to answer straight uh don't forget that we have the dosage so we can play on the dosage huh? when i start in 88 at Prolongé, the dosage of the brut reserve was 11 grams now we are at eight mm. Yeah. So we balance this uh, uh, the this uh, lower acidity by uh, decreasing the, the dosage. That is the first point. Uh, the second point is the fact that now we we make a brut an extra brut, uh, which is very popular on the French uh, French market, very popular also in the Italian market. Impossible to sell in in Asia. But in some part of North Europe, uh, North America, we can. For the New York, New York, the extra brut start to be something uh, uh, well well received. Mm -hmm. So we are going to continue. We um, in England, for example, where people love to keep champagne in their cellars, we see that the sales of vintage are increasing. Uh, because it is true that uh, the brut non-vintage for all the different brands is a wine which is now a bit easier to drink, more approachable, so yes, more popular, uh, to come back to your question, um, and perhaps the more specialized customer will go on the vintage to find this acidity, 
and the new uh, 2013 which will be launched uh, in few in few weeks a uh, few weeks or just before christmas in uh, in canada uh, is a good example we just launched uh, to, for your own knowledge we have launched vintage uh, vintage 2013 in england uh, two days ago it will be launched in france next week and uh, all the other country will follow wow looking forward to it yeah <laughs> It's a great vintage, very sharp, straight. Uh, it will be a very, very nice drink. Fabulous. Very refreshing. And you can keep it 10 years more in your cellar. <laughs> Champagne doesn't make it that long in my cellar, to be blunt. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. This is only still here because it's, it's only nine o'clock in the morning in our time. <laughs> well, or else I'd be gone too. Maybe let's talk a little bit about the history of the estate. Uh, you guys have quite an interesting history, and then um, obviously you guys are also a little bit different in the sense of you with the Royal Ascent and Winston Churchill. So I was hoping you could kind of get into a bit of that. Yes. So uh, Paul Roger has been created by my great great grandfather uh, in 1849, and since the beginning, he point the export market uh, export market and the first bottle of Paul Roger had been sold in UK and not in France uh, so that is the first point uh, and he has always pushed the export market and even nowadays uh, the export market represents 86 percent of our sales uh, we sell in approximately 90 different countries um, so, uh, the success of Paul Roger in England made that we start to be very popular and at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Paul, Paul Roger one of the, was one of the most popular champagne brand in UK and of course in London, which is the key point. And uh, so it's why, and uh, you, you will understand why. Uh, where I'm going, uh, it's why Sir Winston Churchill, young, uh, young MP, uh, young MP, young journalist and writer, uh, but like a lot of people, was drinking Paul Roger, was enjoying Paul Roger. Uh, the oldest invoice that we have is an invoice from uh, 1908 with some vintage 1895. The difference of, of Churchill compared to a lot of uh, his compatriots is he has been, he stay all his life uh, loyal to Paul Roger. And, uh, and so he was, he, was, he loved uh, Paul Roger, he was drinking Paul Roger uh, nearly every day. If you uh, if you see if you if you have seen the uh, the the movie The Darkest Hours, at one stage uh, the the king is asking to Churchill, how can you uh, can you drink champagne your, uh, during lunchtime and be uh, and be uh, in good form and good uh, good spiritual form on the afternoon. And the answer, it's only a question of practicing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, he has been uh, loyal. In 45, uh, he met my uncle and my aunt, uh, Odette Paul Roger. Uh, and from, I will say, a wine lover connection, start a, a very strong friendship. And it is at that time, that Paul Roger is that Churchill start to call his horse Paul Roger and the address of my hunt 44 Avenue Champagne, the most drinkable address in the world. Um, and uh, and we continue that well. Paul Roger hasn't increased uh, as much as uh, the market, so it's why now we are not anymore. At that time, we were in the top four brand of, of Champagne, 
and now we are i don't know which uh, which number we are and we don't care it's not our uh, philosophy and our goal our goal is quality first we have in we have a, a motto at paul roger we have two mottos one which is uh, uh, independence excellence and independence and the second motto is uh, time is not money time is quality uh, and so we do we 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 always focus um i was i was doing an interview last um, last week uh with some french journalist and uh, and they asked me what is your goal i said uh, i said because we are building a new building and they were they were asking why we need to build a new building and what we and why such a big one and i said because because the because it is true that paul roger is selling at the present time uh, one million uh, eight hundred thousand bottles uh, which is not a huge amount in the champagne industry uh, and we would like to achieve two million you know two million for us is a goal and i said but it's a goal in quantity but not in timing uh, when our um, ceo our the past ceo patrice noel uh, arrived at Paul Roger in, uh, in 97. He, 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 said to, he said to me, Hubert, we need to achieve 2 million because 2 million is the right volume, the right size for Paul Roger. And, uh, and uh, uh, oh, nearly uh, a little bit more than 20 years after, we, are not, we haven't achieved 2 million, not because we doesn't want because but because we think it is not the right time uh we don't deal uh, we don't deal a lot in north america is if is uh, is not the case also but in europe it could be uh we don't deal with supermarket uh we don't deal with many customers you don't see a lot of port roger duty free for example uh you have only polongi has only two airlines uh, uh a very small one and a bigger one we have air china <laughs> air china and we have kela air kela uh, is a small company it is the company of new caledonia oh. <laughs> if you fly to <laughs> new caledonia <laughs> Yeah, you will have some promotion on business class. <laughs> uh, that's good. I'll change my I'll change my flight. <laughs> no, but only to say to you that we could, if you know, the fact to be to achieve two million is something very quite easy. Oh, you go to see the right customer who can be, who can add, who can buy big volume and let you go. But Paul Roger is not in this kind of idea. What we want is to produce two million of bottles with exactly the same quality, the same kind of customer that we have at the present time. If we need 10 years to achieve, but we will we'll take the 10 years. It's not a big deal. Do you think then, um do you think the level of quality, not just not Paul Roger, but across Champagne then? Because it feels like to me over the last, say, some years, let's say, let's, let's just ballpark it and say 20 years. Like you said, like there's a push to be bigger and bigger and bigger. And it certainly feels like in the North American market with, uh, you know, other, other brands that won't be named with a bright orange label, they uh, generally tend to, you know, very be much, very flashy in terms of marketing and promotion and trying to sell this lifestyle image. But, you know, like you say, more is not necessarily better. More is just more. So do you think the quality of champagne is still where it was, say, 20 years ago? Or is there like a sort of arms race to be, make more and more and more and be a bigger brand? No, you have... So, to be honest, you need to have the both. 
Champagne, Champagne is a wine, and Paul Roger is, is part of this game. But also, Champagne is a spirit. Champagne is a way of life. Uh, champagne is is more than a wine. Uh, if if people uh, if people uh, you have plenty of other sparkling wine in the world, and champagne is a, is one of the smallest in terms of volume. It's the one that everybody speaks about. But if you take the California sparkling, if you take the Spanish, the Italian, they are much bigger than champagne. So in terms of volume, we will be always smaller. Uh, and I think it's great. But it is true that to uh, make sure, you know, I'm going to tell you a small story. When my father asked me to come in the company, he said to me, I give you the French market. You do what you want, but I don't want to be anymore the champagne of my grandfather. Uh, and it is true that at that time, in the beginning, in the late 80s, uh, on the French market, uh, Paul Roger was has been, was has been, and if each time you were meeting somebody, ah, Paul Roger, great brand, very good wine, the champagne that my grandfather was drinking, <laughs> and you were saying, why, if, if your grandfather was drinking, why you're not drinking, and they had no answer, it was not in the mood. So I changed, I changed uh, the image. I, 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 I took a, a, a press agency to speak with the journalist. I, I changed the, the POS, as simple as that. I, did, I started to do a bit of advertising, not in big, big, uh, mark, uh, big magazine because it was too expensive, but in more specific magazine. Uh, I changed and in the last, uh, and it took me 20 years, so, but I must say, at the present time, on the French market, champagne in, a, in, in, the, in the quality category, Paul Roger uh, is back on stage. And the sales are not in England, in France, even with the COVID-19, the sales are good. Because we are, because now with our image, we are speaking to, to come to, to customer who um, first have enough money, to be honest. Sure. Uh, and also continue to have a second kind of way of life and champagne is part of this way of life. Um, so uh, to come back to your question, you will always have big brands who need to fight, who need to be on the, on the stage all the time and will do it. They fight each other. Sometimes there is some winner. Sometimes there is some loser. Uh, it is true with with problem with COVID nineteen. It is true that uh, some company have difficulties uh, because it is true that some were not in very good shape before the COVID, and they are obviously worse nowadays. And some are in better shape because they can take some share. Uh, alors, don't forget that in Champagne, there is two markets huh, with two war, <laughs> uh, the grapes and the customer. Uh, if you want to have more customer, you need to have more grapes. So there is a real fight also with the grapes because we are on appellation. And nowadays, Champagne is at its maximum in terms of planting. So we, we have now 34 uh, thousand hectares, which is really the maximum. So now if you want to have more grapes, then you need, you need to take some grapes from somebody else. And there is no more, no more free grapes. Uh, it's, even, it's even worse when we speak about Grand Cru and Premier Cru, where there is a real fight also. Um, and it is true that company like us, like our friends from Bollinger, from Pederer, uh, which are family owned, quality oriented, uh, and which makes, fortunately, quite good margin, make that we can attract uh, more Grand Cru and Premier Cru. And it is true that 
uh, company like Prologé, like, like the two others I said, will continue and will perhaps make even better wine in the future. Yeah. So I guess in theory, then it's if Champagne is almost starting to become like Burgundy in a sense where, you know, like it's just be a matter of time before it's just going to start pricing itself higher and higher because they're unless unless they find a way to expand the appellation of Champagne in general and just like, okay, we'll let it expand. How well, there is a possibility. There is a possibility of expanding the vineyards, roughly 5,000 hectares. Okay. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's uh, the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> 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 we, for the last 20 years, we speak about increasing this. Uh, uh, the problem is the, the market is going up, up. So we say, well, we need, we need more grapes. And we know that there is a potential of 5,000 hectares without changing the quality yeah. over more than that yes we could it will be changed but five the, the potential of five thousand is completely we know all of us we know exactly where to plant vineyards which will make exactly the same quality uh, there is village there is a famous village next to Epernay called fontaine sur ai where there is no grapes at all only by, because the mayor of the village in 1928 forget to send back the paper <laughs> uh, only that and this village could have uh, 1000 hectare very easy they are very nice slope very it could be and it would be great it could be a first it would be a premier crew straight away um, so we know we can do it the only problem is each time we say oh well, let's go we can we can do it we let's plant there is a crisis and what we say oh, no 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 it's not time anymore so we don't know when it will happen for the last 20 years we speak about uh, one day but uh, at the present time it is true uh, that we mustn't go too fast Fair uh, champagne need by certain kind of way need to continue to be a little bit exclusive yeah uh, our friends from italy are doing very well uh, and uh, and uh, and it's fine for it's fine for us. Very cool. Um, we kind you kind of glanced on it a couple times, and you talked about the idea of um, champagne is more than just a wine. I mean, like you said, there's sparkling wine all over the world. But champagne is definitely something special. Um, which kind of it kind of comes to me a little bit of a dichotomy because I think that, and I imagine that I would probably see this as well, is that champagne, and I think in the North American market, is certainly seeing growth. And I want to know why you think that is, because it's, you think that, because I think in our market, champagne for so many years, and I think for the majority of people still, champagne is reserved for birthdays and weddings and that sort of thing. But people don't really quite get the universal, you know, how universal champagne is in terms of food pairing wine as a beverage, just not a celebration, but uh, just something to simply enjoy just because. And I feel like the French have much more of a grasp on that. And it's not, yeah. so, it's not such a big occasion. Uh, but I feel like, I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Um, I will say... It's it's fine for, you know, regarding it's fine for me. Uh, it is true that, and it is the same in Asia. The champagne is still uh, a wine for occasion for very cele for celebration. Um, but uh, but at the same time, it is true that some people, you know, champagne is when you speak about the non-vintage, for example. Uh, to achieve, to you know, sometimes people say champagne is expensive, but to achieve the same quality than the Brut Reserve, for example, in the other appellation, by you are obliged to put the same kind of price. Uh, so, uh, so it is true that we have more and more customers who. Uh, Ooh, and it is very true for ladies, for example, uh, by a lot of customers who say that, in fact, uh, 
uh, champagne is easy, it's quite easy to drink. The food pairing is quite easy also. You can drink, you can drink very easily champagne uh, uh, with, with fish, with uh, white meat. Um, and it is true that in the mind of people, uh, people are reducing the bit of, uh, and uh, are reducing the level of, uh, of uh, red meat or of what they are eating. So it is true that uh, uh, champagne pair, ch the champagne pairing is better and better. So that is also something that which work. Uh, the fact also, the fact that some uh, some uh, people, I would say people with a big P, uh, start to to uh, uh, to be interested. You know, I speak about Jay Z, Beyonce, or Brad Pitt now. Uh, <laughs> You know the fact to before before this kind of people was only invest or only interested in red wine, uh, not so much white, but it was always red, or most of the time red. Um, it is true, you know the big difference between people, uh, uh, common people, and the uh, the show business people is. Um, they have they have the wealth of uh, uh, big bourgeois, big uh, businessmen, but for a lot of people, they are more attracting. They are more they are nearer uh, people that you see on your screen, uh, TV, uh, people that you see all the time. Uh, they're more relatable. Seems, yeah, exactly. More approachable. Yes, is the right word. And the fact that these kind of people uh, start to speak about champagne, start to drink champagne more obviously, um, uh, make the champagne seems to be more approachable also. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, it is true that as owner of Paul Roger, I am not a big fan uh, of this way of marketing, but as a Champenois who defend the appellation, Champagne appellation, I'm quite happy. <laughs> <I suppose so. laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, uh, the be you know, for, for me, the best example is Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt is somebody who really loves wine. He's yeah. somebody who, who knows what he's drinking, about what you know, I saw. Uh, uh, Sometimes you see uh, some new wine on the market, uh, which have been uh, uh, just shown by uh, actress, which obviously doesn't know anything about wine. It's sure. there is a businessman sure. behind who say, "Oh, you should put your name on the label." Uh, Brad, I'm a good friend of uh, Marc Perrin, uh, and uh, Brad is coming very often to the on the, in the vineyard and speak with Marc about the wine. And he does the same in Champagne with uh, with Monsieur Peters. Uh, Brad is Brad is somebody who really uh, care about what he is doing and how he and he is pleased to use his name. Of course, it would be stupid if he was not. Uh, and even if he would like, he would like not, to, he's obliged. <laughs> uh, so, but for me, his way of thinking is is more. Uh, more honest, you know, is uh, is somebody who will really invest not only in money but invest in uh, in passion. Well, he certainly um, did wonders for the sales of uh, Rosé de Provence here uh, in North yeah. America. Um, but I mean, I, I think perhaps his wisest choice was to approach Femi Perrin uh, to to actually make the wines. Uh, it, 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 so um, we haven't seen, at least in this market, any champagne from Brad Pitt. Uh, I, I presume I it's, it's not. A, it's not. It will be the first bottle will be sold in uh, mid of November. So it's uh, nobody have seen. Have, have seen no, except on the uh, on picture. Uh, yeah. On picture, the, nobody have uh, uh, have tasted the one yet. The it would be interesting be, to see. 
because I mean, champagne is already, there's an established market for it here. But when Miraval came out, um, at least where we live, there wasn't a lot of uh, rosé sales and yeah. it almost changed overnight. I, I'm wondering what the effect on champagne sale, because I mean, it's not just that Miraval sold, all of a sudden, all the rosé from Provence sold. And I'm wondering if there's going to be a, a, a rising tide lifting all boats of champagne even further because champagne is already famous here. Mm -hmm. uh, alors, uh, I don't. Alors, I don't think uh, because first because the quantity is very very small. Huh? Monsieur mm -hmm. Peters is a very good uh, grower, a very good winemaker. Um, he knows so that the quality of the product will be obvious good uh, for me there is no doubts on that uh, I would be very very surprised if it's not but I know that they are working on the project for more than five years uh, so uh, to be honest being a good friend of Mac uh, I think five years ago he, he called for the project before to call Peter um, because we work together for me in Japan in many countries um, so in terms of quality of the wine, I have no doubts about that. Uh, the quantity will be very small. So it's not going to change the, 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 the market. I and you are true, it is true that the, the, the market of rosé of rose champagne is already quite big. Uh, you know, the day that Miraval uh, pink champagne will be at the will be at the level in terms of volume of uh, Laurent Pannier Rosé or Pilcar Salmon Rosé or Ruina Rosé. Uh, <laughs> that will be another story, but it's not for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of quality, I'm sure it will be good. So awesome. I have no doubt. It almost sounds to me, if I, maybe I'm I'm not, I, mean, I think I'm understanding everything correctly, but it feels to me that champagne is almost going to split a bit like, sort of like, California in the early 90s where you have brands that are becoming big and they're sort of garnering their own celebrity and even through the late 90s even today we have certain brands from California for example that are they're, they're they sort of transcend their category right they're just you know it's this you people buy you know Camus or Prisoner not because of this the wine per se but you know there is just it's become an icon in our market, an icon of a certain style, and it almost seems like, if I'm understanding correctly, it almost champagne almost seems to go that way too. Like there are those yeah. that are very interested in the pop culture, mainstream marketing, you know, the flashy parties, the big boats, the celebrity endorsers, the whole nine, and then there are the other ones that are very much, you know, very much concerned with quality and tradition, and you know, it's almost like a whole different client because those guys that are buying the ones obviously. And not the same drinker, like the same person who no, 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 I'm not gonna throw I'm not throwing shade on any one brand, but like the, the people who drink like say Armand de Brignac are not the same guys that are drinking Paul Roger. No, yeah, absolutely so. not. Paul Roger mm -hmm. is almost like the grand mark for it's the it's 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 the it's the popular grand mark for people who know champagne and know well, mm -hmm. and, and to and that it's uh, why, sorry. It, it's why for example we have on we have you know we are now at all we are the last of the Moican nearly to use classical <laughs> bottle. Uh, and because for us, what is important is inside the bottle and not the shape of the bottle. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if I could quickly you, just ask you, Yvel, um, yeah. uh, because we are now, well, we're not right now I'm drinking coffee, but when this airs, we will be drinking the Brut Reserve. And I was wondering if uh, you could um, describe what is compared to perhaps other Grand Marc what is the house style of, of, of Paul Roger? What, what should we expect when we open Paul Roger and, and that we'll know it's Paul Roger? Alors, Paul Roger, uh, when you open a bottle of Paul Roger, what you expect is something very clean, very straight, smooth. Uh, but the smoothness of Paul Roger is done by the aging. Uh, Paul Roger is one of the oldest non-vintage on the market. We guarantee a minimum of four years of aging. Uh, it, is so, it is even more true with the Sir Winston Churchill, which is minimum of 10 years. We have, we have some customers sometimes some who say, oh, but Churchill, you have 
you have used wood? And I said, no, there is no wood in any of our production. Um, but what you feel like wood is in fact yeast. And what is a yeast is a mushroom. So to have a foresty aspect in the wine by, by, by long, long aging surely, it's something completely normal. So I always say to the people, no, you are not. Yes, there is no wood, but you are not wrong because what you feel is something which is not so far. And, uh, and that is what, what people, what the people are, are asking at Porogé. There is no, uh, there is no real oxidation. The oxidation will arrive much later. It's wine which is straight, smooth, and clean. Wonderful. Is there a certain, is there a certain uh, cuvee you try to stick to in terms of ratio? Like 60 Chardonnay, 30 Piemont Noir, 10 Meunier, or is it generally, is it really play vintage to vintage? No, no, no. Uh, we play, we never play on the percentage of grapes. Okay. Uh, the non brut reserve is one third of each. The vintage is 60 Pinot Noir, 40, uh, 40 Chardonnay. Uh, the rosé is the same with 15% of red wine from Champagne. The Blanc de, the Blanc, de Blanc is obviously 100% Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. because, we want, because we want to be sure that the customer will follow, uh, will follow us years after years. Uh, you have some difference. In the vintage, it's obvious. In the non-vintage, we try to choose the village to make sure that nobody can feel the difference uh, and and so we play some time with the van we play more on the van reserve for example uh, we have some years where you have 20 percent sometimes 30 percent the maximum of van reserve has been 35 percent and the minimum has been 20 percent so we play with van reserve which which with because the Van Reserve will play on the oxidation. And because Paul Roger doesn't want to go too far in the oxidation, it's, we reduce when the, when the year is a bit too opulent, too, too fruity, then we reduce the level of, uh, of Van Reserve to keep this freshness. Mm -hmm. If the year is very sharp, bit acidic, then we had, we put a bit more Van Reserve to round, to, to, to mellow and to, to stop the acidity to be smooth. Right. So it's not, we don't play on the percentage, we play on the village, on the cru, and we play on the Van Reserve. But the percentage of grapes is roughly the same always. Mm -hmm. 